And what have we learned? Well, we learned the second sacred cow has been speared is the book is not fundamentally about suffering. The book is fundamentally about righteousness. Uh, Job's righteousness is what's on the line. Uh, it started in chapter 1 and 2 with regard to the, the devil and the Lord having that conversation. Uh, is Job truly righteous or not? Is it true righteousness or just religious theater that Job is involved in? And so that second uh, sacred cow has been speared with regard to the significance of the book of Job. Uh, that uh, the nature of the debates is, is a debate over can God curse the righteous? And um, theology and ethics uh, tell us that God only curses the wicked. Even the law is set up that way. If you obey, you're cursed. Disobey, you're blessed. Or disobey, you're cursed. Obey, you will be blessed. And God has mercy in the midst of it all. But uh, Job is arguing that... Uh, He's not looking for mercy. He doesn't need mercy. Uh, he needs vindication of his righteousness, and that's the incongruity uh, of it all. And uh, uh, even though the friends insist, and he, he has a tendency to agree that God cannot curse the, right, the righteous, Job argues, yes, I have learned that God can and does curse and judge uh, the righteous, i.e., me. And the third sacred cow that is going to be speared is the identity of Leviathan uh, in the book of Job. Uh, you have in uh, your uh, little packet there an outline called Job the Head Crusher question mark. And uh, then also you have... Uh, a little bit from Andrew Nacelli's book, The Serpent and the Serpent Slayer. Those are three pages that I typed up from his book about identifying Leviathan. And, um, and I think that is a, a correct identification. That When you get to the back of the book, what happens in the back of the book of Job uh, is uh, this appearance of this massive, threatening, terrorizing creature called Leviathan. And how are we to identify it? And I think Andrew Nacelli, with what I gave you there, is on target of understanding that that is a, uh, an, uh, is a physical, on the one hand, physical creature, yet uh, is actually pointing us to or is a guise uh, for Satan. Uh, so I, I brought with me uh, the books that are in the bibliography right here. And this is the one by Nacelli, The Serpent and the Serpent Slayer, professor at Trinity Seminary. And another one that just came out recently is called Piercing Leviathan, God's Defeat of Evil in the Book of Job by Eric Ortland. Uh, so if you know uh, who Ray Ortland is, uh, Ray Ortland Jr., you'll know who Eric Ortland is his son. Well, Ray Ortland has another son named Dane Ortland, uh, who wrote a little book called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. I've got a few copies of it. Looks like I've got two left. So when, when we're done here today, if you make a promise to read it, like take an oath of self maldiction maybe, no, I'm not going to be that severe about it. If you just uh, promise to read it, you can have the book for free. I got two left. I'm going to hand them out. Uh, a, a very gospel oriented, edifying, rich piece. Gentle and lowly, the heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers. Dane Ortland, the brother of Eric Ortland, who wrote Piercing Leviathan. Anyway, got two left. Uh, those are from uh, Gary McDonald. I don't know if you know who Gary McDonald is, but he's a developer in North Fresno, and he gave me 60 copies. and I've been handing them out for over the past year, and I got two left to hand out. So, so the question now becomes: the third one is identifying uh, Leviathan. In the book, Job keeps asking for what? 
uh, I'd like a day in court with God to be interviewed by him so I could tell God where I'm at and get an answer uh, from him for why uh, this is happening uh, in my life. And Elihu comes along, a young man that's a forerunner uh, to the appearance of the Lord, chapters 32 through 37 of Job. And essentially, Elihu points out that, you know, Job, uh, you should have been justifying God a little more than just justifying yourself. And uh, that, that, that's problematic with regard to your whole posture here. And then the Lord appears uh, in chapters uh, 38 through 41 in two phases. Uh, if you look at your outline on Job the head crusher, you have Genesis 3.15 and the two Adam poles. Is everybody familiar with Genesis 3.15? That's after Adam and Eve sinned. God made a promise. He said that the seed of the woman uh, would crush with his heel this, the head of the seed of the serpent, or, 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 I'm sorry, would crush the head of the serpent. So the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, though he would crush his heel. So you see, the, what's the mental picture you have? That's an, that's an ancient Near Eastern mental picture of a king's foot coming down on the head of his enemy, uh, showing his defeat of him. But in this particular picture in Genesis 3.15, the heel is crushed as well as the head of the opponent. And so you have that uh, promise that evil would be defeated uh, as particularly embodied in the serpent who is Satan. So, of course, it's not that uh, God's going to come and stomp all the snakes in the world. It's the fact that he's going to stomp Satan who took on the embodiment of a serpent, a little scaly animal, uh, in the Garden of Eden. And that promise uh, to Adam uh, and Eve in the beginning is fulfilled in the second Adam, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one, uh, the second Adam, that really does crush the head of the serpent upon the cross because what is the point of the cross the point of the cross that is the culmination of the righteousness of Jesus Christ but also that is the culmination of his curse bearing where he defeats Satan and routs him and so we have uh, in Job uh, 38 through 41 this challenge uh, from God to Job uh, of two belt wrestling contests if you look in your outline under number two, shake hands with a dragon. Uh, letter A, do you have the wisdom to run creation? That is the first belt wrestling contest that God has with Job. Look at all these creatures I've created. Do you know about this one? Do you know about that one? Do you know about this? Do you know about the ostrich? And on and on and on. And Job is like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, your creation is amazing, and I can't begin to understand the depths of it. And so God is schooling Job uh, in, uh, uh, in real wisdom. But secondly, then, uh, God has a second belt wrestling contest with Job, and that's in chapter uh, 40. It begins, and I, I, I want you to uh, notice that here in your Bibles. Chapter 40, verse 6, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. You see what God is saying to you? you see what God is saying to Job at this point? Adorn yourself with these divine attributes. <laughs> If you can, right? <laughs> Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. Look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud. Bring him low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust altogether. Then I will acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. What is God saying to Job? He's saying, look, uh, Job, can you bring about 
the final judgment that will extract out of creation evil and save creation. Can you do that, Job? I mean, you talk about shrinking in size. <laughs> no. Job doesn't have either the wisdom to penetrate God's running of creation, nor does he have the power to fix creation and the evil that's entrenched in it. And so now God parades before Job uh, behemoth, which means uh, beast, and Leviathan. And he parades these two monsters before Job. And these two monsters, of course, are in some way, shape, or form part and parcel of the evil that is embedded in the creation that makes it the wanky, difficult, harsh reality uh, that it is. Verse, 41, or verse 1 of chapter 41, Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he, he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him from, for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? In other words, will you be able to you know, take him to the market and you know, sell various parts of him in the fish market? Will you bar traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Will you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You'll not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. He's laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his goodly frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who would come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face around his teeth as terror? His back is made of rows of shields shut up closely as with a, a seal. So, so in other words, he's a big, scaly monster. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. That is between the various shields that are, that are obviously plated one over the other. Can't get anything through them. They are, they are joined one to another. They clasp each other, cannot be separated. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Verse 19, if you're following along in your Bibles. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame comes forth from his mouth. What is the description of this awesome, terrorizing creature that is being portrayed for us in Job? It is a dragon. Now, whether or not you believe actual dragons exist or not, I don't know. I'm not a paleontologist to weigh in on it. But I do know this. Dragons are creatures that, are, that go deep into history, into the ancient Near East, whether they're actual or whether they're just conceived for man's own terror. But this is what's being portrayed here. This isn't a hippo. This isn't a crocodile. Uh, it's a dragon, a scaled, protected, fire-breathing, large, scary creature that javelins or anything else cannot penetrate. In his neck abides strength, terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone, hard-hearted. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. That seems to indicate that angels themselves are terrorized by him at the crashing there beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail. The spear, the dart, the javelin. He counts iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee for him. Sling stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rattle of javelins. His underparts are like sharp potsherds. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge in the mire. 
He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him he leaves a shining wake. One would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth there is not his equal. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? On earth is not his equal? Where have you heard of that before? What? About Satan, but where, where, what piece of literature have you heard that from? The hymn, Mighty, Mighty, Mighty Fortress is Our God. Just want you to know who Martin Luther thought Leviathan was. A creature without fear, he sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Is this portrait here just a creature to frighten Job and humble him? Answer, no. <laughs> What's going on in the book of Job? In the very beginning, we have Satan appearing. And we know in the very beginning, the first two great trials are through his uh, uh, mediacy. But what about what happens after that? What is Satan? What is the devil? Satan means an adversary. Devil means slanderer. What is he? He's one that, that not only tempts us to sin, but fills us with arrows of guilt and condemnation once we have sinned. That's his thing. And so what do we see throughout the, 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 the majority of the book, over half of it? Uh, the salvo is coming in on Job. Job, you have sinned. Job, you have sinned. Job, you have sinned, right? But he hasn't. This is Satan, not, not as the serpent, but Satan using those three friends to continue his work. And now at the end of the book, what is God saying? Can you, Job, resolve the evil that's so deeply entrenched in the globe? This creature who in chapters 1 and 2 is moving up and down, back and forth, to and fro throughout the globe of the earth, uh, having uh, assumed some dominance and darkness of controlling it and terrorizer of death. Uh, can you defeat him? Can you conquer him? Job, do you have the wisdom to understand creation? Job, do you have the power to fix it? And of course, the answer is no. Now, there's several other biblical reasons why we should identify that Leviathan is a reference, whether it's an actual physical creature or just a, 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 a creature of man's imagination and literature uh, that in some ways is, you know, can be seen at least in part in a crocodile and whatnot. Um, as there are other passages that would tend to clue us in that Leviathan is to be identified with Satan. And I have three references uh, throughout Scripture. I just want to look at them quickly. Uh, and hopefully you'll be adequately convinced that th this is who is being uh, uh, brought to the fore uh, in the book of Job at the end, uh, questioning Job, can you defeat this creature? Uh, Psalm 74, uh, verses 12 through 14. Yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for creatures of the wilderness. There seems to indicate that God's victory is over some scary uh, creatures that exceed mere uh, physicality. Then Isaiah chapter 27 becomes a real tell-all of this question. Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent. He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So there we see Isaiah identifying as the same, the serpent and the dragon. The, the one in its smaller form, as in the garden, the one in its growing global historical form as the dragon exercising global uh, dominion uh, in the book of Job. And then Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, 
that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven, now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our Lord, and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives, even unto death. Well, there's more here uh, in that sheet, as you can see, and I also provided for you uh, some direct quotes from Andrew Nacelli's book, The Serpent and the Serpent Slayer, uh, with regard to identifying at the end of the book uh, this guise of Satan under Leviathan, uh, which is present not, not just in the beginning of the book, but Satan's activity runs throughout the entirety of the book of Job. And what is the book of Job about? It's about will Job, as God's champion, defeat the devil through his righteousness, or will he cave? And that becomes the question of the book. Will he hold on uh, to his righteousness and be the victor? Or will he come forth and say, no, I have sinned, and thus fall into the Satan's power? So that becomes a very key component of understanding what's going on in the book of Job and why the, dis why the debates are the way they are and why it's necessary for Job to keep insisting upon his righteousness and holding on to the very end because of this conflict, this uh, battle that started in heaven itself that God and Satan uh, set that broke out upon the earth in the life of Job. So any questions about particularly having to do with identifying Leviathan and the role of Satan uh, in the book of Job. I think a lot of people have tried to identify behemoth and Leviathan as just mere physical creatures, terrifying in their own right, but just merely physical. And I think it falls short of what the book of Job is really getting at, what the Bible is really getting at with regard to the kind of contest that's going on uh, in this book. Let's come to our final culminating presentation at the end. Dragon Slayer, the saga of Job's wisdom quest and foretelling of the Christ will be in four parts going through the book. Uh, looking at Job as holy man, as heated man, as humbled man, and as heavenly man. I'd like to begin by reading chapter 28 of the book of Job, as we've seen before. The 28 is the center of the book because the book is a wisdom quest. It is a, is a wisdom book. Uh, and chapter 28 becomes kind of its, its center point, uh, anchoring uh, what this quest is about. So I'd uh, like to read chapter 28 at this time. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore in gloom and deep darkness. So how's that opening up? What men do, men search for valuable minerals uh, in the dark depths uh, of the earth's surface. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. So you see the idea, a shaft being opened down in the earth, lowering a guy down in a rope. He's swinging back and forth as he's lowered down. Why? Why, why do they go to such enormous and dangerous efforts uh, to find uh, gold and copper and iron and all these things? Well, because they're, great, they're very valuable and they're, they're willing to go to these extents and limits and risks to find them. 
Uh, as for the earth, uh, verse 5, out of it comes bread, but underneath it's turned up as by fire. Its stones are the places of sapphire and its dust of gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it, because they're flying around up here, not in the earth. The proud beasts have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks. His eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle. And the thing that is hidden, he brings out to light. Now, look, this is way back uh, many, thousands of years ago. They'd stop up a stream back then, allow it to dry out, and then they'd search for what? That was, that was called panning for gold in the ancient Near East is what that was. And so here we see these uh, efforts uh, to, of man in this search for what is valuable. But, verse 12, but, what, but where shall wisdom be found? Where's the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth. It is not found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me. The sea says it's not in me. It cannot be bought for gold. Silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued, valued in pure gold. This is, of course, this is a strong and powerful and familiar biblical theme. Nothing can compare with having the wisdom of God. It would be better to live in a tent with wisdom than in a mansion without it. Right? So where's true riches at? Got nothing to do with these externals. Got to do with what you have here and here. Right? From where then does wisdom come? Where is the place of understanding? Of course, this is the quest of the book of Job, isn't it? Trying to find the wisdom to understand this. It is hidden from the eyes of all living, concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and the death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. It's out there somewhere. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens when he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain in a way of the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. He said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, to turn away from evil is understanding. So you have a bottom line here, don't we, in the book of Job, that no matter what, no matter how mysterious and impenetrable, or as Job says, no matter how hedged in your way is, <laughs> the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Whether you got your life figured out or not, and you probably don't. But the way of wisdom is to fear the Lord, turn away from evil. And Job was, a, was the poster boy. He's the poster boy. Look at the beginning of the book. That characterized him. And he could not find out and understand this particular phenomenon that was happening to him. Chapter 31, we read about, the, about uh, the 14 oaths of self maldiction that Job takes. And after he takes those 14 oaths of self maldiction, that those culminating statements of Job, he says, I have not, I have, if I, if I have concealed my transgressions as Adam did, verse 33, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence, didn't go out, out of doors. Words, I was afraid because I had sinned. I wouldn't even go outdoors because I was so nervous that people would look at me and know indeed I've done something wrong. No, no, if, if that's true, then may I be cursed. But then verse 35, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature, signing off 
and the covenant document of 14 oaths of self-maldiction, let the Almighty answer me. All that I had, the indictment written by my adversary, I would carry it on my shoulder, I would bind it on me as a crown, and I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. So Job was confident of his righteousness that he could wear the very indictments of God into his presence to receive a reverse ruling. And so we see that the book of Job is not fundamentally about you. It's not a manual for suffering. I don't know how many times I've heard the book of Job is a manual for suffering. Well, all I have to say is, okay, if it's a manual for suffering, are you ready to take 14 oaths of self maldiction to your own righteousness and integrity? Because that's what Job did. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm running the exact opposite way. <laughs> no, the book is about Christ. As we saw in this beginning and ending, as Jesus says, the Old Testament is about him and his suffering and his glory. The book begins with suffering and ends with glory. We move into the B section, God's, Job's complaint, and then God's appearing and answering his complaint, using 60 plus of Job's own words to rearrange them and answer him as, as the sovereign God of wisdom and power. Letter C section, we move in even closer to the center. We have the friends dialogue with Job, and then we have Job and Elihu's monologue that match up in the C section. And then the B, where is wisdom to be found? What wisdom can explain the epical shift in Job's life? That's the earthly question. But there's a heavenly question that precedes the earthly question. Remember? It was God and Satan. Is Job righteous truly, or is Job just involved in religious theater? Is Job righteous or not? And that brings on the trial by ordeal in his life, which is what the book of Job is about, the test of true righteousness, and will it endure? And so, first of all, we have the holy man, Job. Job is located between the two Adams. The first Adam was tried and tested for righteousness by the devil. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, was tried and tested for his righteousness by the devil. And now in between here stands Job. Between these two poles as a, as a holy man. A man who's received God's approval in the very beginning and is subject to testing set before the craft and power of Satan. His holiness is affirmed by the text, as we very opening verse, two verses of Job uh, say, but it's also backed by God in heaven. Have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. Singular, standing out like a big light, like a big sore thumb in your dark domain, Satan. What do you think of him? Boy, there's some real baiting going on. And so this heavenly dispute, God takes the lead on it. God is leading Satan along. He's engaging Satan. Hey, you, who, uh, where you come from? Oh, I'm going up and to and backward and forward on the earth. It's my territory now. God says, oh, and that's something. Oh, did you notice, by the way, there's a little incongruity over there in the land of Ur, Job? A little shining light over there. It doesn't quite make sense, does it? belonging in your great kingdom that you're ruling over down there. <laughs> He's leading them right along, just like Luther said. The devil is the Lord's devil. And he takes the bait. Well, you've hedged him in, in with blessing. No wonder. No wonder uh, he's giving you uh, such a favorable review in his life. You've given him a five-star mansion, and all he has to do is pay a little studio rent of offering a few sacrifices and nodding your way and mumbling a few prayers? No wonder. But does God, does he love God for no reason? Does he? Does he love God for no reason? Does he serve you for no reason? He serves you for yourself? 
St. Augustine said that God created man to love God and use things. But man has been perverted, so he, uses, he, he loves things and uses God. And that's the debate between God and Satan about Job. Which is he? Does he use God and love things, or does he love things and use God? Well, God says, well, look, he's the real deal. He's the real McCoy. He's righteous, truly. Satan says, no, he isn't. I know he's born of a woman. I know what he's really made of. He's a hypocrite. Just religious theater, that's all. Torch that life a little bit, melt that wax, and the real deal will come shining right out. We'll identify him for who he is. So God says, let's have at it. So there's fire that's introduced to test the metal of what? Is Job truly righteous? The question of the book from heaven. Does he fear God and turn away from evil? And you might say there's a secondary point going on there. Is saving grace in the life of a sinner that powerful? Is it more powerful than Adam in the garden? The answer to that is yes. And that brings us to the second one, the heated man. First, there's the double whammy where his possessions and his posterity are stripped away. Then there's the second phase of his person stricken. Stricken and clothed with humiliation and pain, sitting upon the ash heap, sitting upon the dust, sitting upon the fired place. And we have here a picture of two phases of Christ's humiliation where he left all of his possessions of glory behind to come to this world to suffer in his own person. And so Job anticipates, you see, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous one who would come and suffer. And chapter 3, Job offers his great complaint, I wish I was just born and carried from, from womb to tomb. It would have been far easier than what I'm going through now. How miserable his life was. How depressed, how down. Chapter 4, we begin the beginning of those complaints, or those accusations against him. There's the triple whammy, you see. He's loaded up on the spit and he's turned over the fire. Slow burn, slow barbecue Job uh, as his friends uh, dig away at him and seek to eke out of him a confession, an uncle. Okay, okay, I've sinned. And his integrity would finally crack. Throughout chapters 4 through 25, the final words that Bildad sputters out in desperation which we already read, Job's piety is under attack. If he confesses sin, who wins? The devil. I was right all along. Just needed to bring it out. His friends and Job agree on certain issues. They agree that God is sovereign over good and evil in the world. They agree, and the, the ancients affirm it, that, that God blesses uh, those who honor the Lord and obey Him, and the wicked God curses. They agree on that. And they also agree that God has turned His back on Job, that God is judging him, God is cursing him, and it doesn't make any sense. But what Job disagrees on, as he debates his three friends, is does he need to seek mercy for his sins? And Job says, no. What I need is vindication for my righteousness. What I need is an explanation from God of why this is going on at all. Yeah, I believe it. I believe he, 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 he wounds and he heals. That's the kind of God he is. <laughs> Job agrees with it. <laughs> but I don't need to be wounded. I don't need correction. I don't need rebuke. I need vindication. Because I've not sinned. And yet God, he, Job says, God contends with me anyway. And the point of contention can be summed up simply as this. The free friend says, look, God cannot curse an innocent man. He won't curse a righteous man. Job says, oh, yes, he will. <laughs> He's cursed me. Why do these three friends react so strongly to Job in the narrative as we read about it? It's because Job is overthrowing original sin and total depravity. His doctrine of man is defunct. It's crazy. 
And Job lacks the fear of God for his holy justice by suggesting, by suggesting that God would condemn a righteous man. His, his doctrine of man is screwed up. His doctrine of God is screwed up. Job, you're, no wonder God is treating you the way he's treating you. What's the solution to all this? What's the wisdom that will apply to bring a resolution to what Job is facing? You know, it's obvious what the friends say. Look, Job, we've always admired you. You know, you've, you've helped out a lot of people in your day and you've cared for them. You, your words have strengthened the weak and many complimentary things they could say, but you're still defective, man. <laughs> Even at the very end, as Bildad sputters out his final words, it's like he's begging him, look, Job, God is so holy, the angels, uh, you know, don't even uh, take a direct look at him. How much more you, a corrupt worm and maggot that you are, born of a woman, a sinner. Look, Job, I, we want to make it easy for you. Just say, uncle. It'll all turn, the sun will shine again, Job. And what is Job's response to all of this? Biting sarcasm. I'm not going to lie for you and trumpet some phony confession to satisfy your theological assessment and wisdom. I'm righteous, yet I'm suffering the lot of the wicked. And the incongruity has an explanation that only God knows. I wish he would explain it. And so in chapter 28, we see this Little soliloquy is right in the middle of the book. Where is wisdom to be found? How do we unravel this? Well, the book says, fear God and turn away from evil. Right on. But the problem remains unresolved. Is Job really righteous? Why does he suffer so severely? If he's so severely righteous, how can that be? So in chapter 29, he reviews his life with the friendship of God and respect of man. I like how he says this. He says, my steps were bathed in butter. <laughs> Ancient Near Eastern way of saying, man, I was gliding through life. <laughs> my steps were bathed in butter. <laughs> but now, chapter 30, God has become my adversary. And men mock me. And he summarizes his life in the last verse of chapter 30. Those two, verses are summed, those two chapters are summed up in a single verse. My lyre, that is a musical instrument, is turned to mourning. My pipe, the other musical instrument, to the voice of those who weep. That's the change. And I can't account for it. He has three lawyer friends staring at him. Three nuthetic counselors gone to seed, I like to say, in search for his sin. Circumstantial evidence all mounted up. Sound traditional theology all against him. Now what? And Job pulls out his final tour de force. Chapter 31. 14 oaths of self maldiction Lines them up. Rows of two. Seven of them, fear God, seven more, walks up and down them, a proverbial covenant of works that Job lays upon himself if he is not righteous. I've loved God from my youth. I've loved man from my youth. He says there's no skeletons in my closet. I'm not hiding like Adam did amongst the trees. And he signs his signature. Submit it to the courts. May God bring his indictments against me. I will wear them into his presence. And God will recount my steps and reverse his decision. Amazing. Outrageous. What do we make of all this? What do we make of this storyline of Job? It's shocking. Is this guy just utterly self-deluded? 
Will you identify with Job? Yeah, I'm, I'm really down and out and bummed out. I'm going to read Job for some comfort. Okay. <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> I, ready to argue with God about how righteous you've been and how could you possibly treat me this way? Now I say that because that's a sacred cow that I'm spearing here and that Job is pointing us elsewhere. I mean, you can find comfort in Scripture for your suffering and pain in life and other places, even in Job to a certain degree. But that's not really what it's about. Because Job's a type of Christ, a singularly, severely righteous man, subject to severe suffering. A righteous man who strangely bears the wrath of God for indictments not his own. As God said to Satan, You've, you, uh, I, I have, I've come against him without cause. There was no cause in Job, though God came against him. Is there hyperbole in this book? Job's claims, is there exaggeration? Is there bravado? Is there foolish daring? Even sin? <laughs> well, God had approved of him in the beginning. This is my star pupil, Job, shining like a light in your dark kingdom like no one else's business. Hmm. But yet, as we read in the book, he cracks. He's a bit unhinged, borders on insanity, self-righteous insanity. But somehow this fits into God's plan. There's a big picture here. There's a big picture that we should not miss as new covenant believers in Jesus Christ, believing that the whole Bible is our Bible. The old points forward to Christ. The new reflects back on Christ. The old is anticipating Christ. The new is the fulfillment of Christ. As Augustine said, the old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed. It's there. This is a Christological book. And Job is pointing us to one greater than Job to come. Born of a woman. Born of the seed of the woman who in perfection does stand before God, as Hebrews 7 says. He is holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and what? Exalted above the heavens. The requirement for heaven? Righteousness. That's why Jesus Christ is there, my brothers and sisters. That's why you have hope who are not righteous of being there. <laughs> and yet, he wears indictments, not his own, into the presence of him who is consuming fire. A turban of thorns on his brow, written decrees against him, Colossians 2.15, confident that he will emerge vindicated. The written indictments that he wears are burned up in fiery judgment. And yet it is his righteousness that will certainly prevail. God, justice will be satisfied. God will reverse the verdict upon the Lord Jesus Christ and vindicate him. Because righteousness merits resurrection glory. Righteousness defeats the devil. Frequently, people want to read the book of Job with a philosophical bent. Why do the righteous suffer? That has a lot of problems of its own, doesn't it? Who are these righteous sufferers? I haven't met one yet. <laughs> but anyway, the question here is, why does this severely righteous man suffer so severely? Why this singular light situated in Satan's dark domain suffer? And I just want to say there's two answers to this question in the book of Job. There's an immediate historical answer, but there's also a distant, ultimate answer. First, the immediate. Job is heated up to put on display Job's righteousness to the principalities and powers. That's the beginning of the book. 
right? Is he righteous? Yes or no? That's the wager. So the flame fires high and hot, and the gold in Job is revealed and confirmed as pure. He is God's champion. Job defeats the devil, and God defeats the devil in Job. But the second, the greater one, is the, is the redemptive one that points to the future in Jesus Christ. A ball is seen here in play in the courts of the Old Testament wisdom literature. A ball that rolls from Genesis 3.15 that the heel of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. It's rolling. It will not stop until it stops at the foot of the cross. But on this rolling ball, as it passes through the book of Job, headed toward the gospel accounts, it's engraved with a tiny inscription upon that ball. Head crusher. It rolls through the biblical canon and it stops to refuel here at the book of Job, heralding one who is greater than Job. One born of a woman to face demonic trial and divinely decreed suffering. One whose fire-tested righteousness bears indictments, not his own. Worn as crown of thorns and rope. Wears them straight into the flames of holy justice. And though this confident daring of weak flesh, through that the powerful Leviathan is crushed. All four Gospels picture this same phenomenon as the cross of Jesus Christ hammered in head, in hands, crushed in feet, nailed to the cross, is suspended above the hill called what? The skull, the cranium, the heel crushes the head of the serpent in the cross of Calvary. The wrecking ball has arrived. This kingly victory we see ahead of time typologically, partially, veiled, shadowy in the book of Job. Through judgment and through vindication what happens? The unwise. The unwise. The wayward. At the end of the book, find reconciliation. You want to find yourself in the book of Job? Where am I in the book of Job? Well, pick the name. Do you like Bildad? Zophar? Eliphaz? Pick any of them. That's you. Who's you? <laughs> you are the one who are you cannot think your way out of the paper sack of morality. You're stuck in it. But you need what? You need, yes. You need to realize that God can curse a righteous man. That's what you need. You need Job. You need Jesus. And so they come to Job that does what? He is the one who offers sacrifice and prays and intercedes for them. And his prayer is heard. It's true that, as we read in the book, weak flesh in and of itself cannot conquer the scaly, crafty garden serpent. A garden serpent that had now, thousands of years later in Job, morphed into a global dragon, the beastly Leviathan. It's true. On earth is not his equal. <laughs> Indeed. But if you join the divine to the human in Jesus Christ, the man of God's own choosing, the big caliper gun of judgment can be fired with the trigger of frail humanity and Leviathan goes down. Yes, even as he's hanging there dying on the cross, he's at the same time crushing the serpent. Job points us to Christ. 
Job points us to Christ, the truly perfect one, the truly righteous one, the one who suffers curses for indictments not his own, the one who crushes the serpent dragon's head, and the one who captures glory as the reward for his righteousness. Job points us to Christ. There is wisdom in Job, but there is a greater wisdom in the book of Job. There is the greater wisdom that Job points us to Jesus Christ and his work in our behalf. That through weakness, the powerful can be defeated. As Luther sang in his hymn, one little word shall fell him. What is that one little word? It is that little word of gospel proclamation. It is that one little word of God's foolishness, which is actually God's wisdom. It is that God can curse the righteous and remain just. And God has cursed the righteous and remained just for you and for me. And Job, even though he comes forth as gold, he still is a flawed man. As all the Old Testament saints were, all the holy men of old were. I like the saying from Jamie Buckingham, all the holy men have gone and died and all that's left is us sinners to carry on the ministry. Well, that's the Old Testament. Oh, there are all those holy men were defective men. And even though they pointed to Christ. So Job, a holy man, was defective. He received three corrections. He received correction from Elihu. It says in chapter 32 regarding Elihu, he burned with anger toward Job because he justified himself rather than God. And when God appears, what does he say to him? Will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? And Job was defective. Wasn't 100% perfect. And Job and God brings two final corrections to Job. He brings him a wisdom c- contest. Can you penetrate creation? He brings him a power contest. Can you defeat the mighty Leviathan? Job has neither the wisdom to understand the depths of how creation is run, nor does he have the power to extract the evil that's so deeply embedded within the creation. That inextractable evil, of course, is, is the great Leviathan, Satan himself. So Job was corrected by man and God. We see that as we come to the end of the book. Job, though he was a righteous man, was flawed, He should have vindicated God in his righteousness. He should have affirmed God's wisdom. He should have affirmed God's sovereign rights to do what he wants. He's not going to violate his own being, which is just. (laughs) Job so flawed was not Christ, yet he is a type of Christ. God's stormy correction in the very end does not betray any lack of confidence in Job. That's an important point. Though Job is corrected, God's confidence in Job remains from beginning to end. My servant Job has spoken rightly about me. And you three birds have not. God cannot curse a righteous man. Oh, yes, he can. And if you do not believe that, you can kiss redemption goodbye. You can pay for it yourself. (laughs) Which brings us lastly to the heavenly man, the end of the book, which I read to you. Job graduates in double fullness of glory. This is typological glory. Even his daughters are are noted to be really good looking, beautiful. Why? (laughs) Why? Uh, some type of a sensuality introduced all of a sudden here, uh, Mary Kate or makeup moment. No. What's it showing? It's showing that Job in entering into glory, uh, his daughter Sharon, is anticipating Christ at the end of the book of Revelation where his bride uh, shares in his glory. Job's giving a little hint of that. And the beauty of his daughters typologically. Job's righteousness is rewarded in the end of the book. But this higher world, this fuller world, this world of of glory uh, as it is uh, in uh, chapter 42. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job 
and gave him twice as much as he had before. Wow, what a way to, to, to put it from an Old Testament perspective. It's through his righteousness Job defeats the devil. And because of God's, or because of Job's righteousness, what does he do? He qualifies to mediate at the altar. Who's mediating at your altar to bring you into God's presence? Ah, yeah, amen. The righteous one. You need someone righteous to mediate for you. Praise God, we see that in Job mediating at the altar for his three friends who did not speak rightly of God as he did. It's as if the text is implying that these three friends being reconciled to God through Job's mediation get to share in the fruit of his righteous reward. Or as Hebrews 11 says, he brings many sons to glory, Hebrews 2 says. So in conclusion of this conference on the book of Job, Job's wisdom quest is a rough ride, but it has a glorious ending. So where is wisdom to be found to explain how a righteous man can be assigned with the wicked? How do you explain it? Two things in closing. First of all, in Job's person. Job was hedged in. God said to, uh, Satan said to God, you've hedged him in. Made his life a cushy ride. And after Job got crashed and dumped on on that ash heap, he says, well, God has hedged me in. <laughs> Satan was complaining, you've hedged him in with a blessing. And Job was complaining, you've hedged me in with cursing. <laughs> well, when you're hedged in and in the dark, what do you do? The righteous man fears God and turns from evil. That's what he does. And Job is certainly a shining light in the midst of the devil's dark domain. Wisdom will hold on to God for the end. Can't argue with that. But there's a second component that stands out even stronger in the book of Job. As you understand the Bible Christologically, Job is prefiguring Christ. It's a wisdom not of this world, you see. It's a wisdom not of the law. It's not of the elementary principles of the world. It's a wisdom that in the world's view is foolishness. It's even outrageous. Condemn someone who's righteous? Come on. That's the answer to life? Oh, what foolishness. We know basic ethics. God blesses good people. God sends bad people to hell. That's basic ethics. It's justice. Book of Job turns it on its head. As you see, the cross utterly is morally insane to the flesh. It requires the illumination of God to understand it, that God's foolishness is wiser than men. He puts the pain and the suffering of his curse on the head and shoulders of his perfectly righteous servant. And therein he crushes the devil. He redeems a people bringing them with his servant into glory. That's God's plan, that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we now by faith in Jesus Christ, by that one little word that Luther spoke of, that one little word of the gospel, we overthrow Leviathan. We go free from the salvo of his accusations. In our case, true but not sticking because of Christ. And we inherit eternal glory. We come into glory through his robes of righteousness, holding on as he ascends, having none of our own. It's true, we groan now, we suffer temporarily in this life in union with Christ. That's true. But at the same time, Though you may suffer, you at the same time rejoice in the foolishness of the cross by faith. The three friends insisted that God cannot curse a righteous man. But by faith, we agree with Job. God can curse a righteous man. For without that faith, without that truth, you can kiss redemption goodbye. Rather, by faith, we are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ and his suffering and his glory. 
a suffering and a glory told long ago in the life of a man named Job. Amen. Any closing questions over what I've backed up my Job dump truck and pulled the lever and now I've buried you under it? Any questions sticking out of the sand, seeking a little oxygen? Yes, Mrs. Anderson. Well, uh, mean mean as as a personage, or do you mean as a literary piece? Uh, as a person, where do you see everything? Yeah, um, yeah. I, m most people want to put him uh, somewhere within in in a in the uh, maybe a post patriarchal setting. Uh, not 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 a uh, direct lineage bloodline son of Abraham, but a true believer which there are many of, you know, Melchizedek, others. Uh, so uh, most people want to locate him around, after what? After the king? Oh, no. Uh, the, king. The, the, the patriarchal era, so it's before, before, long before Sinai, right? That's where most want to locate him. Yeah. So somewhere, you know, somewhere what we would say is the patriarchal era. Uh, and, and it doesn't strain to try to clue us in on that. Um, now, as far as a piece of literature goes, uh, I, again, if I'm piercing sacred cows, I might as well throw a spear at this one. Uh, a lot of people think that Job's the oldest book of the Bible, and I think that is this canonically wrong. Um, Job is part of the wisdom literature, and the wisdom literature flourished in David and in Solomon. So Job, Job as a wisdom book, particularly the advanced wisdom. I mean, Job, the three friends, you could say, are versed in Proverbs. I mean, if, if, you, if you see their arguments and see what they're saying, look at the book of Proverbs, hey, sounds pretty good, makes sense. And Job says, I don't have any argument with you, right? So it, it, it's really an advancement beyond a step beyond the basic wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So uh, I would say it's part of the flourishing of the wisdom literature that came from uh, the uh, Davidic and Solomonic kingdom eras where the, the theocratic kingdom was so richly blessed and you have uh, wisdom literature flowing out of it. So I, 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 I think that's canonically, that's the only reasonable place to put it. I think trying to locate it as the oldest book that somehow wandered into the canon is really a Kind of a strange theory, actually. But anyway, that not shooting the fourth sacred cow, I guess. M Michael. No, no, n somewhere between Noah and Jacob, I would yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. And, uh, and you would say, would you say it would come from like, from, because I know that Solomon was known as the wisest man that ever lived on, on earth, you know, yet he had like, when, so you would say it came from like uh, one of the latest stages of Solomon and his wisdom from the literary standpoint. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's in terms of canonical studies yeah. of understanding how the canon is put together. Yeah, yeah I think you, I think that th th it all points that way. Yes. Hey, someone else had their hand up. John. So would I. That's why Job affirms it. He doesn't, he doesn't disagree essentially with what they're saying. He, does, he, he affirms it. Hey, I, I, I know this. Am I, am I inferior to you? 
This is received traditional stuff. But what's distinctive about it? Job said, I'm not, the reason I'm not buying it is not because I disagree with it, it's because it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> yeah. If you told me that, I would be down in the dust. And I'd be thinking, oh, there's no doubt I've sinned in some way. And just no, but, no, but you, see, you guys all know me. I'm going to say, I understand that. To me, it's like, wow. Job has to be like a special person to be able to say that. Yeah, I think that's right. Right on. <laughs> Who was pointed out in Satan's kingdom as being special? One person. <laughs> Why? Why? Why, 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 is it, why does it have the shape it has? It, you, the only way you can explain it, in my humble estimation, is because it's pointing to Christ, the true wisdom, the true righteousness and wisdom of God. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, you know, look, uh, holy men, all right? There, there are many holy men throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah is a holy man. Ezekiel is a holy man. Daniel is a holy man. Uh, uh, Abraham, I mean, the Jews have always considered Abraham their epitome, their poster boy of a holy man. I mean, all right, we have these holy men, but we know that though they were holy men, in a relative sense, they were defective. And we also know that the doctrines of original sin and total depravity are true. <laughs> And at the end of the day, though, J though, though Job may be like James 1, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What's, what's James talking about? He's talking about a level of profound maturity, right? Uh, you know, the Bible talks about uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah walking in all the commandments of God. Uh, wow, he's actually angels embodied in flesh. It, it's a manner of speaking, right, that is true, yet maybe a little... You know, saying a little bit more than what could possibly be said reasonably. And I think with regard to Job, here's a godly man, and the language is pregnant, right? The language is pregnant. Why? Because God wants to mislead us and make us think, oh, there was one person who never sinned other than Jesus. No, the language is pregnant for a reason. It's God's reason. It's pointing us to Jesus. And it's pointing us to what? This supreme supreme issue of righteousness righteousness is what we need if you're going to go to heaven you got to have righteousness man well where, where do i get it <laughs> amen there's only one place to get it that's why it's by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone right? that's why i mean and, and job is just like opening that up to us and saying righteousness is very, very important. Otherwise, why would you spend over 21 chapters, over half the book of Job, committed to one question? Is he or is he not righteous? Why? Well, the only answer you can come up with is because he's anticipating Christ. He's a type of Christ. And he's a type of Christ in, in a very rich way, right? Yes, sir. What's that? Yeah, by faith in Christ. It's just, and the friends are kind of a picture of that. Why do the friends get reconciled to God? Because Job, who spoke right, mediated at the altar for them. On what grounds is Job mediating at the altar? Because he's righteous. He's my servant. He passed the test. He's come out as gold. He can mediate for the three friends. Praise God. Praise God for Job as he anticipates Christ, that, that our desperate need for righteousness, a tested and tried righteousness, is not contingent upon you and me. Because if I'm tested and tried, I don't care. I'm going to falter at some point. For some point, I'm going to cave. I might cave when the kids are taken away. I might cave when uh, uh, I'm sick and afflicted with disease. I might cave when my wife finally throws in the towel and says, Pfft. I give, curse God and die. Uh, I might cave when my friends come around and start drilling me. And, I'm g and the comfort they came to bring me, you know, just tastes like poison, drop after drop. I might cave then. I'm going to cave, though. I guarantee you. And so are you, I think. I think you'll agree. You're going to cave. 
well, I'm, I'm flesh. I'm sinful flesh. I can't. But, but w- what is needed? You need a righteousness that no matter how hot you turn up that flame, it comes out as pure gold and it wins God's approval. It wins the day. And uh, that's why the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, I'll put a plug in for what the Reformation was about. That's why we need an imputed righteousness. We don't need a righteousness where me and the Holy Spirit are working together to get me as sanctified as I possibly can, like Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy teaches. I need a perfect righteousness to get into a perfect heaven. Where am I going to find that? One place. And that's why the Bible strains so much and hits so hard that theme. And that's why it's found in Jesus Christ alone. Book of Romans, right? And how does the book of Romans end? May the God of peace himself or, 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 or the, the God of peace will certainly crush Satan under your feet. That's the end of the book of Romans. Well, why is that? Because the book of Romans proclaims the gospel of righteousness that's not your own by faith. And that's what the message of the book of Job is. The right? book of Job is this Old Testament subtleties anticipating New Testament light shining brighter and brighter. Okay, are there any other questions before? We, we, we're, we're 10 after, so I, I, I said the conference would end 10 minutes ago, so a few more, yes. Uh, so if Job's three friends have been right, so that's the not cursed for righteous man, wouldn't Jesus have lived a life of righteous man? Yeah. And again, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's the difference between law and gospel, right? Law and gospel are fundamentally different principles. Uh, one says, do these things and you'll live. Right? That's, that's, that's law. What's gospel? Gospel says, just believe these things and you'll live. Law says, produce righteousness, you'll live. That was the message of the three friends. It was a sound message. It wasn't defective. But the gospel says something else. The gospel says that law that requires righteousness is found in someone else, not in you. And that curse that de- deserves payment is resolved in someone else, not in you. So Augustus' top lady's song, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no respite? No. All for sin could not atone. Right? So that's, that, that's law gospel right there. And you see it right there in the, the friends and Job. Law and gospel. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm going to uh, say thank you for everybody who came. I hope that this was beneficial. My prayer to God is we glorify my God and my Savior Jesus Christ, but also serve to strengthen your faith in the truth of the gospel as you consider uh, the book of Job together. So let us conclude uh, 